And the beauty of this venture is to invite our audiences to embrace this genteel world in Dublin on the Feast of the Epiphany in 1904. And what makes this into a unique theatrical experience is that the audience is not just asked to sit in a darkened theatre and silently observe the drama unfold. They're invited to enter in and fully immerse themselves in the experience. We invite them to walk off the streets of New York on a winter evening and like a time machine, arrive at a middle class party. I know that this is very bright surroundings. <laughs> but as Paul pointed out, it was not quite, so you have to imagine this. Uh, in, in Edwardian Dublin in 1904, as guests of Aunt Kate and Aunt Julia, you're all their guests. We invite you to eavesdrop on the trials and tribulations of the domestic <coughs> servants and their nervous hosts. We invite you to bear witness to the inebriated Freddy and his very long-winded tales. And you can be our guest to, to join in the dancing and in the singing. And then when it comes time for dinner, to join the family and sit down and eat dinner and hear Gabriel's carefully painful worded annual speech. Greta, you look tired. I am a little. You don't feel ill or weak? No. Tired, that's all. Greta dear, what are you thinking about? Tell me what it is, Greta. I think I know what is the matter. Do I know? Oh, I'm thinking about that song. The last of all, what about that song? Why does that make you cry? Why, Greta? I'm thinking about a person long ago who used to sing that song. But who was that person long ago? It was a person I used to know in Galway when I was living with my grandfather. Someone you were in love with? It was a young boy I used to know named Michael Fury. He used to sing that song, The Lass of Ochran. He was very delicate. I can see him so plainly, such eyes as he had. 
big dark eyes and such an expression in them, an expression. Oh, then you are in love with him. I used to go out walking with him when I was in Galway. Perhaps that's why he wanted to go to Galway with that Irish girl. What for? How do I know to see him, perhaps? He is dead. He died when he was only 17. Isn't it a terrible thing to die so young as that? What was he? He was in the gasworks. I suppose you were in love with this mighty fury, Greta. I was great with him at that time. And what did he die of so young, Greta? Consumption, was it? I think he died for me. It was in the winter, about the beginning of the winter, when I was going to leave my grandmother's and come up here to the convent. And he was ill at the time in his lodgings in Galway and wouldn't be let out. And his people in Uktorod were written to. He was in decline, they said. Something like that. I never knew rightly. Poor fellow. He was very fond of me, and he was such a gentle boy. We used to go out together walking, you know, Gabriel, like the way they do in the country. He's going to study singing only for his health. He had a very good voice for Michael Fury. Well, and then? And then, when it came to the time for me to leave Galway and come up to the convent, he was much worse. And I wouldn't be let see him, so I wrote him a letter saying I was going up to Dublin and would be back in the summer, and hoping he would be better then. Then the night before I left, I was in my grandmother's house in Nun's Island, packing up, and I heard gravel thrown up against the window. The window was so wet I couldn't see, so I ran downstairs as I was and slipped out the back into the garden. And there was the poor fellow at the end of the garden, shivering. And did you not tell him to go back? <coughs> I implored him to go home at once and told him it would get his death if in the rain. But he said he did not want to live. I can see his eyes as well, as well. He was standing at the end of the wall, where there was a tree. And did he go home? Yes. He went home. And when I was only a week in the convent, he died. And he was buried at Uchtorad, where his people came from. It's all the day I heard that. And he was dead. Greta. She's fast asleep. So she had had that romance in her life. A man had died for her sake. It hardly pains me now to think how poor a part I, her husband, have played in her life. I think now of what you must have been then, in that time of your first girlish beauty. Your face is beautiful, but it is no longer the face for which Michael Fury braved death. Why am I feeling this riot of emotions from what is it preceded? From my aunt's supper, from my own foolish speech, from the wine and dancing, the merrymaking and saying good night in the hall. Poor Aunt Julia. She too would soon be a shade with a shade of Patrick Morgan and his horse. I caught that haggard look upon her face for a moment when she was singing arrayed for the bridal. Soon, perhaps, I would be sitting in that same drawing room, dressed in black, 
my silk hat on my knees. The blinds will be drawn down and Aunt Kate will be sitting beside me crying and blowing her nose and telling me how Julia had died. And I will cast in my mind for some words that might console her and will find only lame and useless ones. Yes, yes, that would happen very soon. One by one, we are all becoming shades. Better pass boldly into that other world with, in the full glory of some passion than fade and wither dismally with age. To think that you have locked in your heart for so many years that image of your lover's eyes when he had told you that he did not wish to live. I have never felt that towards any woman. But I know that such a feeling must be love. It's begun to snow again. The time has come for me to set out on my journey westward. Yes, the newspapers were right. Snow is general all over Ireland. It is falling on every part of the dark central plain, on the treeless hills, falling softly upon the bog of Allen and farther westward, softly falling into the dark, mutinous, shallow waves. falling too upon every part of the lonely churchyard on the hill where Michael Fury lays buried. Lays thickly drifted on the crooked crosses and the headstones and the spears of the little gate and the barren thorns. Snow falling faintly through the universe, and faintly falling, like the descent of their last end, upon all the living and the dead. 